biography than we published from the museum. Um, Matthew grew up mostly in Brisbane and was uh, a member of the Queensland Naturalist Club. And he went to the Uni of Queensland and worked in aquaculture for a while um, because he couldn't get a job in other things. Is that, is that right? No, he's scared of getting a job anywhere else. Yeah, you didn't, didn't want to get a job anywhere interesting. Yeah. Um, so he was volunteering in the Queensland Museum in entomology and then got a research assistant job in spiders. And uh, that was his first museum job and his interest in mites started when he was working at the museum helping prepare a rare owl which had died mysteriously and he found a large paralysis tick on its neck. It had been paralysed and no one had realised. And that was the early realisation of the complexity of interaction between creatures, both large and small. And in my um, conversation with Matthew, as I do, I like to have a bit of an anecdote. And he said that one gravid female kangaroo tick uh, that he kept uh, was fascinating to watch her slowly lay her clutch of eggs and then the 2000 eggs develop and then hatch but then you have 2,000 plus tick larvae all looking for the nearest warm mammal fur <laughs> to bite. He kept the lid on the container. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming, Matthew, and uh, welcome. <laughs> just try and stick the uh, yeah, videos there yeah. and uh, just down arrow. Right. Is there a, there's no pointer? No. Uh, no one. That's all right. That's all right. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for your interest. Um, uh, mites aren't something that most people think about, but I know you people are very interested in nature, so I'll try my best to interest you in them. Um, they're just beyond our normal perception. They're, they're, most mites are about half a millimetre long, about that. Um, which is just a little bit too small to see normally, but just about any mite I'm talking about, if I had a, a sheet of white paper and you had a good desk light on it, you would see the little speck crawling across it. And you can actually see some detail in many cases. Um, and with just a hand lens or modest mat magnification, you'd actually see quite a lot um, and really be able to tell what it was and appreciate it more. But it's, it is amazing how many mites are around us and escape our attention and every time we walk across the lawn we're actually walking across um, hundreds if not thousands of mites um, they're just um, that's a bit too small uh, and contrary to popular belief most mites are actually really good and more than just harmless actually good i wanted to talk about as a provocation perhaps just why we don't think about small animals. And I think part of the reason is historical. So if we go back to the very early uh, thinking about um, in Europe, um, about what scientists, etc., what European culture was excited by, and what got Europeans extremely excited was the rhinoceros. This is an extremely famous image uh, by one of the most famous drafts people of all, Albert Dürer. Um, and this drawing made him famous in 1515, among other things, his other work, of course, too. But I hate this picture. I really dislike it. Because even though it's very uh, striking, it's actually inaccurate. Um, and this is well known. But this is not what a rhinoceros looks like. And it's, it's, it, to me, it's like people were craving so much the big and the exotic and something really striking that they would even tolerate something that is inaccurate, it has extra horns on its neck, has extra plates that aren't really there. It's much more heavily armored than even a Indian or J Javan or rhinoceros would be. Um, it's, it's actually not science in a way. It's, it's just um, a satisfying appetite for exoticism. But another image that Albert Dürer did 12 years earlier than that to me is a very beautiful painting because it invites us to look at something very humble and beneath our feet. And, um, uh, and even though it's not showing any mites or insects or anything like that, it's, it's called um, a piece of turf. And it's just 
is just what sustains us, especially for a culture that depends on pastoralism, uh, or at least used to a lot. Um, it, you know, it, there's a lot there. There's a lot of nature there. There's a lot for any naturalist to study. Um, and it is, astounds me, 500 years on, how little we actually know. So that, um, that's, that's how I'd like to start talking about it um, and just say that there's historic, it's not just us, it's not just us now, it's been a long time that people have ignored it, even though in 1600s we had microscopes and there was a lot of excitement at various times, they still don't know very much. But what, um, what we're walking over when we walk on the ground is things like, this is an orobatid mite, Orobatid mites are one of the uh, very diverse groups of mites, 172 families. 9,000 species are described at least, but it's actually far, far more than that that exist. Um, in uh, the few places that have actually been estimated, the diversity, like um, some places in the United States, there's 160 species of orobatids in one national park. Um, but there's probably lots of places where you could get more orobatids than that. Um, what they do is they break down vegetable matter and return nutrients to soil. They're a very important component of um, uh, providing nutrition to plants. Um, one of the most diverse groups in soil, and you know, soil is called the poor person's rainforest. It's, it's, there's a lot of diversity there. Um, but even amongst that diverse company, orobatid mites are one of the most diverse of all. Um, I'm actually not going to talk much about them today because what I thought I would do is really focus on things that mites you might have seen and then expand your knowledge from there or try and introduce you to things that, um, uh, that you're already familiar with and find their relatives. Um, but I'll just, I'll just talk about a few other examples of uh, great diversity in mites. So here's a pisalid beetle. Um, pisalid beetles are found in various places in Australia. I found out recently they were, at least, maybe they still are in Renmark. If anyone collects pisalid beetles in South Australia, I'm very interested to know about it, particularly because they have so many mites on them. In fact, they have uh, my colleague who has is, is, is studied this a lot. Uh, there were 27 families. He's just found another one. Um, and some of these families only occur on Pasala beetles. So um, highly diverse communities um, on these beetles um, and mostly harmless. Uh, Just looking at the big picture overall, there's um, maybe crustacean people would argue with me. Um, I'm not sure. As far as I'm aware, mites are the second most diverse group in the world. Um, the estimate, and it's not an uh, ex outrageous estimate, is um, half a million species. And the estimate for Australia is 70,000 species, and that's not. Um, that's reasonably conservative, I think. Um, and it's really to do why there's so many is, um, hmm, it's a big question, why? I just asked it, didn't I? Um, <laughs> why did I do that? Um, it's, uh, it's to do with using many different microhabitats is probably uh, one of the main reasons why there's so many mites. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, I really need to introduce you and orientate you with them. So I better just talk about the size. Of course, the defining characteristic of most mites, not all, is small size. Um, and this, uh, this image shows you that uh, some common mites are scaled to the head of a pin. So you can see that our angels, I'm thinking of them as angels, <laughs> on the head of a pin. And, um, that's what I would mean about they're just as specks. You could see them as specks or even quite ornate little specks 
crawling around with their busy little lives. They're actually quite complex animals. The genome of, of some mites is not that much smaller than a human genome. Um, they have nervous systems, they have breathing systems, they have uh, lots of things. So there is some simplification. Anything that becomes miniaturized does have, um, uh, loses some bodily system. So for instance, some mites um, uh, don't have um, extensor muscles for legs. Uh, lots of mites do, but some have lost them. They use hydraulic pressure instead. Um, but, and there's sometimes the breathing systems are a bit, um, uh, how should I say, simplified, but um, they are still complex animals with complex behavior. Um, it's just that they uh, are small. And um, because this is the butterfly conservation group, um, uh, I'll mention Asher Treat, who's got the uh, quote there, um, and he wrote a whole book on mites and moths and butterflies, and it's full of wonderful writing and wonderful quotes. Um, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about some one thing he discovered later. I'll also mention, um, because we're in South Australia particularly, one group called the Oligomacidae. When I sample from leaf litter, I am sampling um, massive amounts of orobatid mites, but also massive numbers of oligomacid mites, which are predators. Um, these are arguably the most common micro predators throughout the Southern Hemisphere. So there's lots and lots in particularly wet soils, forest soils, um, Mount Lofty, etc. There's lots and lots of oligomacids. And David Lee, who was a curator at uh, South Australian Museum, was an expert in this group. Um, and he's just a um, uh, lot of what we know about oligomasses in the world was started by his studies. Um, there's two common genera I've put up there. Um, and it's amazing, you know, I go to a place like Scotts Creek and I find one thing quite similar to that top one there, possibly in the same genus. And I find something similar, it's a slightly smaller, and then I find another one. And there's three, probably three undescribed species, 95% undescribed. And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot to describe. <laughs> uh, but, and um, they're very diverse. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to ignore lots of mites because it's way too much to talk about. It'd be like trying to talk all about in all of all insects. So I can't do that and um, you'll fall asleep. But um, I'll just start with some familiar ones and then introduce you to their relatives as a way of uh, introducing some broader groups. So um, thinking about what the people know about, I had to think of ticks. Um, so that's what a tick sticks into you. That's a paralysis tick. It has a particularly long sticking in thing called a hypostome. It's pretty nasty. Um, that's to embed itself in the wound so you can't easily dislodge it. It's like a Phoenician battering ram. It doesn't, it can't, it doesn't move in and out or anything. There are other um, organs cutting digits on the other side of that, um, that barbed prong, but the barbed prong itself is rigid that just sticks into the wound. Whoops. And there's a kangaroo tick that a very clever photographer managed to photograph while I was on his arm. <laughs> Steady hand, one hand. Um, and true dedication, <laughs> not pulling it out. Get the, get the photo first. And that's after it's fed for probably five days. If you have a fully fed kangaroo take, uh, tick might feed for eight days. Actually, I had someone come to me in a museum once um, and he'd been to somewhere in the northern, northern part of Australia, I'm sure it was a Kimberley or Northern Territory or something, and he had a, a kangaroo, fully bloated kangaroo tick on his ear. And I was just astounded that someone, like, they talk about males ignoring their own health. It's like, you've got to be <laughs> bulbous thing on your ear growing bigger and bigger. Don't you go to the doctor? He doesn't want to interfere with his holiday. Anyway, he realised it was a, didn't, he realised it was a tick. He didn't know it was a tick until, until he got home. So he didn't know what it was. And, um, but anyway, so they get quite big. Um, <laughs> And the reason they get big is they're concentrating a blood meal. And this is a kangaroo tick. She takes ages. 
it's one of the signs I think that can, that ticks are actually a very ancient mite group. Um, is is it um, how how cumbersome their uh, mating and egg laying are? They're very bizarre mating and egg laying. It's it's I won't go into the whole details of it. Uh, I'll just tell you things like they they protrude these little wax organs and they individually coat each egg as it comes out of be from um, their genital organ. They bend down, get pick up each egg, and then coat it with wax and drop it. And they do it two thousand times, and then they get a mass of eggs. It takes a whole week to lay a batch of eggs, so it's very slow. The the, the mother dies exhausted um, after doing that. Not surprisingly, um, but um, and so they're, they're, those hard ticks are the most familiar ticks, I think, kangaroo ticks, and because they're related to ones that get on dogs and cows and stuff like that. But then there's uh, soft ticks, um, very common on seabirds. That's some I rinsed off one poor chick there. Um, I wanted to mention soft ticks because um, they're very important. Well, to me, they're very interesting in South Australia because they're, they're extremely good at uh, handling um, dry conditions in the desert. And there's actually several species that were collected in the 60s and described in the 60s and never been collected since. So places like the Nullarbor have great biological interest to people like me because I want to ferret around in nests and get um, things like this. Although this one is actually on chooks and egrets and, th and herons scale. and things like that. Pardon? What's the scale of that? Ah, okay, that one's a millimetre. Thanks, Jerry, because what I should say is if you see any little white lines on the, the pictures, there's, some of the pictures have it, and it's just a white line, it'll be one tenth of a millimetre. So that's the scale usually. This is a bit bigger, being a tick. Is an undescribed tick. Well, actually, I think it's undescribed tick from um, brush tailed possum. Um, astounding that really common animals we don't know their uh, parasite faunas. Um, and so ticks are familiar to you. What you might not be so familiar with is um, a, a related group called the holothyroids. And in Australia, there's a family of holothyroids called the Allothyridae. There's only one um, holothyroid described from all of Australia. It's from Waterfall Gully. But um, they're not parasitic. They, they roam around the forest floor, uh, Mylor, uh, quite a few wet places around um, Adelaide, you can find them. Um, uh, I think there's a few undescribed species, not that I've had a chance to really look at them. And one of the reasons I think that is because that one there, with the white background, is five millimetres long. It's quite big. Um, it's, I think it's quite different to the, the other um, species it's described. And there's lots of species all around the East Coast and New Zealand, and they're just basically all undescribed, um, despite their importance in understanding a really important group. Um, ticks, which are uh, obviously very important for disease in the economy. Um, so that's ticks and uh, whole thyroids are, are, um, are one clade, you could say, that a related group. Um, very ancient lineage. Um, there's still a lot we don't know about them, especially things like the soft ticks and the um, allothyroids. Another group of um, mites uh, you would have come across, I think, are red velvet mites. So uh, right now, um, around um, quite a few months of the year, but particularly the wet months around uh, here. Um, in the leaf litter, there would be uh, various things related to red velvet mites crawling around the leaf litter. Um, there's a lot of them, and what we know about uh, this group of mites um, has a lot to do with uh, Ron Southcott at the South Australian Museum. He had a, um, he often uh, looked at moths and butterflies, uh, particularly moths, and collected various uh, things that feed on moths uh, in this group. Um, and his collection is in the South Australian Museum, and there's masses of notes, like literally a, a, a field notes from here to here in bound volumes. Um, and it's actually quite a resource for anyone who wanted to get interested in, in this sort of thing. Um, 
the the um, uh, red velvet mites. There's a spotty one there, and the, and the big fluffy red one up there. Um, and then there's these other ones which are called erythraean mites, which are in a different superfamily actually, but um, they're actually the ones, those long-legged ones. They're the uh, ones you'll often see around um, Adelaide, I think. Um, particularly that one at the bottom, things like related to that, uh, rainbow ear. The thing up the top, um, the spots on it, um, uh, white stripes and spots on it, um, that's uh, something I'll tell you about uh, uh, in a moment. I'll first tell you about this. So um, this is described by Southcott. This is a, a common um, a relative of red velvet mites that feeds on Lepidoptera eggs. Uh, this particular one was that wouldn't distress people normally, but when it's feeding on endangered Richmond bird wing butterflies, people were getting quite distressed about it. And it's like, no, protect the valuable mite. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, this, this is actually quite a voracious uh, predator of um, Lepidoptera eggs, and um, that's, that's the food plant of Richmond bird wing um, butterfly in uh, southeast Queensland. And uh, the, the thing that's feeding on the egg there is a nip. And then it gets even bigger, and uh, these are fairly big eggs. This is a big butterfly's egg. Um, and then it even eat, eats more eggs when it's that size. But in fact, it's, it's possibly even worse than that if you really care about insects, because, oh, didn't I put the picture in? Oh, there we go. So there's, that's not a, um, this, this, this is a different species. Um, but this, they all start, this whole group, all of them, thousands of species actually, um, all feed as, par as parasites. So that's the other way you'll encounter so people with your sorts of interests. You'll encounter these mites is um, if you see little red blebs, red dots on various insects, it'll be something in this group. The bright red, they have um, carotenoid pigment, which is probably to um, protect them from UV light, and it's also probably to advertise distastefulness. Um, and uh, they feed on lots of different things. There's uh, things like uh, Granny's Cloak Moth, that's what I call them, what do you call um, There's Dazzy Poder and, and um, uh, other things like, similar to that. Um, I have uh, have um, things similar to this on them, uh, and lots of other animals too. Lots of um, grasshoppers, um, spiders, um, stick insects like here, um, and then arachnids too, just spiders and all sorts of things. Have 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 uh, these things feeding on them? Um, they probably don't like it, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you have to. <laughs> Have to suffer for diversity, biodiversity, I suppose. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to tell you about that. It's it's a bit hard for me to gen, uh, get too specific about it. There's there's so many of them. Uh, two main superfamilies. There's actually more than that, but uh, two main superfamilies um, and many many species. Um, but that that's the the interesting thing about it is that all of them are parasitic as larvae. Um, and they have this complicated life cycle um, where they have the, the parasitic larvae, a feeding nymph that's often feeding on um, fairly immobile things like eggs, but sometimes, you know, insect pupae that are prone or something. And, uh, and then adults feed the same way as well. Um, and they have these other life stages too, which is a bit obscure really to talk about, but I had this nice image. This is, they, they also have, three immobile stages as well. And this is the first of them. This comes out of the egg. It's actually called a pre-larva. It's a very sort of primitive mite feature. Um, that's leg buds there. There's funny, there's, you can see the six sort of things there. Um, but that, that will uh, molt again. And that's what the larva comes out. And then larva sort of runs around and looks for something to suck the blood off. So um, that ones, the ones I showed you on the, um, 
uh, Richmond Burbank butterfly, I, um, I got a female to lay lots of eggs. And then all these really long-legged ha like, um, larvae hatched out, really long-legged, running everywhere, very, very fast. Um, and they loved light. You, you put in the vial and you put a, a torch at one end and they'd run towards the torch. So that they loved going up, I would say, uh, up towards light and trying to find an insect to suck the blood of. Um, and so that's something familiar, now a bit familiar perhaps anyway. I'll, now I'll tell you about something that uh, you may be familiar with. That's uh, a relative of these, um, that those short-legged red velvet mites, they're related to chiggers. So chiggers bite vertebrates, including us. Um, and uh, if you go, for instance, to Robe or um, anywhere in the swamps around there, you might get a scrubbage, um, scrubbage from chiggers biting you. Um, so that's one local place you could, um, instead of biting rats, they might bite you. Um, but there's lots of different chiggers, lots on reptiles. So yeah, I'll take questions any time because our oh, chiggers is C H I G G. E R. Yeah. Sorry for throwing jargon at you. Um, yeah. So um, and here's here's a so uh, chiggers don't get seen that often, and people should possibly be glad of that. Um, they can transmit diseases, and um, they're not in that ninety nine percent of good mites. They're actually in the smaller percentage of um, mites you don't want to encounter very much. But this is a very specialised one that I'm showing you here now. This is one that um, has only ever been recorded on um, mainly Eclectus parrots in Papua New Guinea and Northern Australia um, and in uh, self-crested cockatoo nests in uh, Iron Range. Um, and the interesting thing is it gets onto those birds, not only that, when it it has that same lifestyle where the, the, the larvae are parasitic, just like all those relatives I talked about. And then the, the um, nymphs and the adult stages are predatory, but they're, they're very specialised though. They only live in the parrot nests. And there's similar things on reptiles too. Right. Oh, we don't have anywhere near enough information. Yeah, it's just that it's just like it was initially described in 1939, um, which is an interesting time to be in Papua New Guinea given what was happening. Um, uh, and then I managed to, uh, with other people's help, they collected it for me in um, Cape York. And that's the only time it's ever been collected. So um, it's pretty specialised. You have to actually, you know, trap the like, collectors' parrots and part their feathers and look for the things, or you have to go, have to climb a, a very high tree and get the substrate out of a tree hollow nest, which is what people did for me. Um, and that's the only, so it's not surprising. It's hardly ever been looked at. But I would guess actually that it's, it's um, habitat specific. So it's, so it is on also on sulfur crested cockatoos in Iron Range. So there, there's, there's a bit of sharing of nest hollows. And I'll actually talk a bit about that in a, a little while. Um, if I don't run out of time, I'm probably can use the time. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, so uh, talking about other familiar things, um, I can't really, I should mention Varroa. So, um, Varroa is a highly specialised mite. Um, it uh, is on, was originally only on Asian honeybee, along with other related mites um, on Asian honeybee. There's actually a whole fauna of mites. We only tend to hear about the ones that become a really big problem, but there's actually a whole lot of things that live together. And as someone, if anyone needs to understand what's going on, you actually have to identify the the not so um, harmful ones as well, because uh, that becomes a question if you're trying to figure out what's harmful and what's not. You have to know what the other things are too. But uh, Varroa has come to attention in the last few decades. Um, and to me, it's a bit like um, 
uh, when black rats first came to Europe and brought the plague in, because we had the mixing of Asian honeybees and European honeybees for the first time, it would seem, um, and that meant there was a transfer of parasites in these two closely related hosts. Um, and Asian honeybees could cope with Varroa, but not the European honeybee. Um, and it's not just Varroa, there's things related to Varroa and uh, that are also concerned, another thing called tropilalaps. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is, um, this is me being a mite scientist and whinging about not enough <laughs> um, research going on, but it's, it's actually worth observing that Varroa does not have a stable family placement. No one can really tell you what its relatives are or uh, what family it's in, because the family it's given at the moment is not correct. But, um, it would only happen in mites. Um, but I'll tell you about some of the relationships with Varroa that, I've, that I believe from my uh, morphological research. Um, before I do that, I'll just tell you about the group it's in. It's in a group, a superfamily called Dermatosoidea, um, and it's incredibly diverse in its habits. So sometimes they look boring, they don't do many interesting things, but in terms of their habits, they do so many different things. There's lots of different ones in soil, um, lots of different ones on insects, many different sorts of insects, on millipedes, scorpions, spiders, um, mammals, birds, reptiles. Um, it's really... <laughs> no fish? <laughs> no fish. <laughs> no fish. No, they, they, they're not that aquatic. Yeah, yeah. So, no, that's... No, no, they're not. Let's be about they, they should, on God's green earth that wouldn't be eligible for mites attack. Yeah. Well, and there's one superfamily of mites. Um, there's other... Most things get attacked by mites of one sort, especially terrestrial organisms. Um, but uh, this particular superfamily has a particular propensity to um, be able to track hosts and live with them in various ways, not necessarily harmful ways, sometimes harmful for sure, um, sometimes uh, quite beneficial. Um, the things I'm showing you up there now, there's an ant mite, there's a, uh, a possum mite, a bat wing mite that only lives on bat wings. Um, and that thing that's on the, the fly, that's a bat fly. So it's actually something that feeds on the blood of bats, but it can chew, carry around on bats, but sometimes it'll, if it wants an extra uh, lift, it'll hitch on the bat, bat fly. So it's, it's got two uh, suites of host preferences in its repertoire. It can choose to go on either. Um, so they're quite sophisticated sometimes. Here's a relative of Roa. This is a native uh, um, mite. Um, it's not commonly realised to be related to Roa, but I'm telling you that I think it is. Um, and it's on um, uh, Lassia glossum bees. So the larger uh, Lassia glossum bees that uh, have uh, burrow nests have, have this lovely mite on them. It seems to be harmless. Its, it's mouth parts don't look like it could be parasitic. Um, here's another harmless thing, another relative of, of, of Varroa. Doesn't look anything like it, but there's subtle differences in its um, subtle uh, characteristics of its uh, leg hairs and stuff that tell me that it's a relative. Um, and it just feeds on pollen, so harmless to bees. Um, but what's really interesting is the way something that can be so harmless or even beneficial can evolve. It's, it, it has relatives that can evolve to parasitism, in, including highly pathogenic parasitism. Um, so all the possibilities there, very dynamic systems, I think. Um, but now we move past Hymenoptera. I was telling you about things that are all somewhat related. Here's a thing that's um, quite interesting in South Australia is this, um, this mite that lives on trapdoor spiders. It um, is often found in a little groove on the top of the carapace called the fovea. But what's interesting is we've um, we observed it once a few years ago, at Queensland Museum, that we got on the, the male pouts. And they're all clustered there. And that was so surprising. And it's like, that can't be accidental. What are they doing there? And I've asked people to look out for it. And since then, we keep finding it. And particularly with um, some of the uh, armoured trapdoors, 
uh, local armoured trapdoors. It's a regular thing where they, they're on the, the male palps. Now, the male palps in spiders are used for mating. So what this seems to be is it seems to be a sexually transmitted disease or I don't know if a disease is the right word, but like they're probably just a harmless symbiont, but it's sexually transmitted, I would suggest, mm -hmm. simply just because why else are they clustering on the palps? It's to transfer for dispersal, what I think. Sort of crabs, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, but nice crabs. <laughs> nice crabs you want to pat. We think, we don't know. We'll have to ask the spiders well, what they think of it. They have all the problems, but obviously you don't. Yeah. So, and this is a really bizarre creature that uh, was only described last year. It was, sorry, that's not quite true. It was described 135 years ago. Um, and then 20 years after that, it was, um, people were talking about it and comparing it with Varroa. And it's just amazing how little attention was paid to Varroa um, until recently. But if people had sort of paid attention, um, Varroa wouldn't have been forgotten about, this wouldn't have been forgotten about. Um, but anyway, this, this amazing mite uh, occurs, um, we now know, on the wings of raspy crickets and sometimes in the spiracles. So raspy crickets, they're very fierce looking crickets that you'll get in the um, woodlands around here. Um, uh, don't let them bite you, they're really quite... Uh, fierce <laughs> biters, um, quite impressive uh, little orthopterans all by themselves, but they have a lot of mites on them. Um, this complicated diagram I won't go into because there's actually another mite here that actually sometimes parasitizes the one on the wings. Just, to, <laughs> just It's a hyperparasite. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite complicated. But uh, Berlesia, um, is, is, is on these um, certain raspy crickets. It is in South Australia. I haven't managed to recollect it. There's one collected from 1948 from a grasshopper in a swimming pool in Adelaide. Grasshopper. Mm -hmm. I think it was a raspy cricket. Um, so I'm very interested to see raspy crickets from Adelaide. Um, there's probably more of these to be found. Um, and they're really bizarre. They actually, if we look, Look at the females. The females have uh, cutting digits that go like that. Now that's actually quite interesting. Most uh, things might have cutting digits that go like this. If you have very fine cutting digits in your parasite, you might go like this. But this goes sideways and it actually has complementary action where they can do use quite strong musculature and do really quite uh, strong cutting movements into uh, the cuticle of their host. Um, so you'll see that on here, the female on, on this side, on your left, has the digits cutting down. Then the female on that side, you'll see the digits are up, ready to cut down again. But you see how they're just sort of operating together, not independently. Um, that's actually quite like ticks. It's the only, it's the closest thing we know to tick feeding that's not actually a tick. That's the female. The male in the middle there, he doesn't feed at all. That's because his mouth parts have become as long as his entire body and they can't feed, they're just um, mating organs. He's got mating organs as long as his own body. And that's because he's very, very impatient. <laughs> And the female, that female there, the white one, she's still in her nymphal skin. She hasn't emerged yet. So what he's doing is his evolution has provided this thing where uh, the race to mate has meant they're, they're so impatient that the, the uh, males are trying to mate with her when she has, doesn't even have a genital opening. She's actually finding the genital opening beneath the nymphal skin in the thing it still hasn't emerged. So this is, uh, we don't know of any other examples like this. So it's um, really uh, extraordinary sort of evolution. Um, I'm sure you want us to know that. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is out of order. This is a relative varroa too. This is an ant mite. Um, probably harmless. 
lots of these. There's actually a thing where you get um, where you get multiple ant mites in this genus on one species of ant. You seem to get uh, size like Russian dolls size stacking, and it's a like one point like the square root of two relationship in the size. So one will be two thirds the size of the other one. Um, yes. That's right. Oh, and I, I don't know how I'm going for time, but I just wanted to, um, this is another really interesting thing that anyone interested in moths, I would like them to know about. So quite boring looking moths, um, things that are sometimes called army worms and things like that, various noctuids, um, some other families too. Um, in one ear, only one of their ears, can have this mite. So this is a, um, a situation where this is a mite that goes into the ears of moths, um, not noctuid moths and some other moths have ears. Um, it goes into the ear and actually destroys the hearing in that ear. But the really interesting thing is it, they never go into the other ear. Once the first female colonizes and others may colonize too and follow her, um, it may not be a single founding event. They won't, they, they will avoid, they won't make the, their host deaf. If the host gets deaf, then it be, could be eaten by a bat that the, the moths need to hear uh, to avoid bats. So it only makes it half deaf. Um, so some, some chance of everyone surviving. Um, this is actually um, one of the best instances in, that I know of, of uh, a, a well-known, well, a, 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 an important theory in evolutionary biology called the intermediate virulence hypothesis. It, it's a common idea that everyone is familiar with that, you know, uh, a parasite logically shouldn't harm its host. Um, but it's not, it's, it's not off, there's not that much proof for it actually, uh, in, except in cases like this. But you wouldn't be a successful parasite if you made a habit of harming the host to death. You could just become. Well, just you're just, but you might have more than one host. You know, basically animals do whatever they can get away with. Um, like some humans, you know, it's just um, <laughs> it's just survival. So, um, so yeah. Think about it. I mean, I've seen I've seen ticks in. Lizards ears. Yes. Yep. The blue tongue, particularly, they're easy to find on blue tongues. They mm. often have them in their ears and they have them behind their front necks. Yep. So places that are difficult to groom. Yeah. And yeah. there's quite a few mites that get but there the too. The idea of them being moths ears is just mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're actually, I'd really love to get fresh specimens of those actually. Um, I've trapped quite a few noctuids and not found them yet, but it's it shouldn't be too hard to get them because it's just. Um, How much magnification would you need to be able to see? The main thing is that the, the, the moth ears are covered with lots of scales. That's the difficulty. Yeah. I think I need to trap lots of boring looking moths, pull their wings off, <laughs> and then pull lots of scales off to do it quickly. And things that lepidopterists would hate. <laughs> they, they hate me. So you're not a real entomologist. Um, Okay, so I, I, I really have no idea about the time. Sorry, Jerry. Yeah, okay. Um, so another uh, local example I wanted to tell you about is um, I, I made the claim that Dermonisoid might sort of live in more places than most uh, little creatures. Um, one group I'm quite interested in um, live in tree hollow nests. So this is pretty important for us understanding Australian fauna. Uh, this uh, mite is um, uh, related to things that are highly parasitic on lots of uh, possums and also um, carnivorous marsupials and stuff like that, but it also lives in parrot nests. Um, and it's, we don't know, it could be parasitic, it could be predatory, it could be actually be both. Um, but another really amazing thing is there's two, that's one genus, there's another genus with two species in it, and they can all co-occur in glossy black cockatoo nests on Kangaroo Island. So they're the same size, they look almost the same, you have to look at them quite carefully to realise that they're different genera and species, 
but they're all they're all doing different jobs. They're all part of. It just shows you how complex um, the natural world is. And I think it's very important for nest hygiene, um, for um, clearing out, um, particularly some introduced pests, um, is to have predators like this. Here's another um, two species from the same genus, and it just shows you uh, a bit of diversity here. The smaller mite there is um, highly parasitic. Whenever you find them, well, most of the time when you find them, they'll have fed on blood. It's very obviously parasitic. They're on carnivorous marsupials. The bigger one, is a quite ferocious predator. I've kept them in culture and they avoid one another because they're like, if you're a fierce predator, cannibalism is a problem. So they, 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 they will shuffle away from each other and hide away. Um, and they probably do a lot of cleaning of um, in nests and um, keeping nests clean and um, of, of avoiding and um, stopping parasites from exploding in numbers. Um, and there's another one in the same group. It's sugar gliders, this particular species. That's a parasite. But here's, here's an introduced one. This is a starling mite. This is another familiar thing you might have heard of um, or been bitten by. And I'm sorry to say, even though those other things I was showing are highly specialised, mites are so versatile, starling mites are highly generalised, not in their feeding habits, but in their um, host uh, habits they'll get onto um, almost every bird. So I found them in kiwi burrows, in um, uh, burrowing, burrowing seabird burrows, in um, eclectus parrot nests, in um, almost every sort of nest I've examined of many different sorts. And including in highly, um, uh, what most people would regard as highly natural situations. So they've spread, um, like terrible pests throughout all of Australia and New Zealand landscape. Um, and we really need our native um, predators, which are part of the, the predatory fauna, to control things like this, because when eruptions of starling mite, probably spreading disease and other things around, um, apart from the blood they steal from uh, their bird hosts. And that's how they do it. There's um, their very fine specialised mouth parts with a groove down the um, side. They put them like that, two mouth parts together with a groove, and then they make a feeding style by putting them together. Um, who um, eats the mites? Um, so other mites, um, those larger mites like I talked about, but um, then things like pseudoscorpions, um, little beetles, there's quite a few little beetles. Um, a couple of families actually specialise on eating mites. Um, yeah. Uh, tiny spiders. Um, yeah, I think that's part of a healthy um, uh, nest situation. Is, is is a lot of different predators there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Uh, I'll tell you if you want. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. what's, the, what's the story as far as um, would the would Australia's native birds, for example, um, would they have been happily resigned to their own mites and, and potentially more threatened by the way we brought in different sorts of bird that have different sorts of mite that the local the local species, the indigenous species aren't accustomed to? I just wondering I how much of a threat that sort of thing is. I mean, you're always hearing about zoonoses, you know, horrifying bacterial things, horrifying viral things, mm. but it seems to me that some of those, some of these mites could be pretty bad as well, particularly the ones that drink blood. Well, I don't think we can answer it precisely. I'll just say in a general way, just having complex ecosystems, and you can see there's lots of com components to this complexity. Well, we can't unimport the stuff we've imported. That's right. Um, but the, the, if, you ha if you maintain the complexity in your environment and don't have too much edge effects and not too many, you know, loss of, of, of this sort of diversity, um, even though it's, you know, small and... But it, um, 
that that surely adds resilience to the system. So uh, if you have quite a few cockatoos which have good quality nest hollows with lots of, um, you know, uh, uh, rotting material that allows a nice uh, invertebrate community to live uh, in the nest with them, that can that could probably, I can't say for sure, this hasn't been investigated, but I would think it would promote nest hygiene. Um, and it's unlikely that a pest mite could uh, wreak havoc. Mm. Whereas if you, in a situation where in a very highly modified landscape um, and there's very poor quality nest hollows and there's not much choice for the birds, then surely there's chances for starling mite to take a hold in places where it's too dry, for instance, for predators to be or just for the lottery of life, the predators haven't managed to come and it doesn't have that protection. Because, I mean, we've got to the stage now where I've started seeing nest boxes that have been put up in trees for yeah. various species to reside in. And I was thinking in my innocence and simplicity, oh, what a nice idea. But if it's... It's not necessarily a bad idea at all. I just... Um, I, but these things made out of milled timber may not be particularly appealing to the, to the good mites. Um, I, I can't answer that. I mean, I think... Um, uh, I, I think... Well, I think all, changes, we don't know how far they're going to go. No, we don't. We, I mean, I'm just sketching out some complexity here. And there's leaving lots of unanswered questions, I'm afraid. Um, one thing I'd say is that uh, 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 when you're thinking about nests and nest hollows, you, you want to think about um, a decomposer communities that live in there, because that's a lot of the diversity comes from a decomposer community. And so what that means we're talking about old nest hollows where there's lots of complexity, including even quite large beetles in some cases, you know, very compl complex systems. Mm -hmm. That would be, to me, a really healthy community and one that would be far less perturbable by introduced things. That's not to say uh, nest, there's a problem with nest boxes. I don't, I think nest boxes are really good in many, many situations. So um, I wasn't, I was, didn't want to imply the nest boxes were a problem because I'm not sure they are. Um, I'm not going to, I think I should finish up now. This last slide just shows you an evolutionary story. Those mites I was showing you, like starling mites, um, one of the things that happens in mites, I was saying how dynamic it is evolutionarily. Um, one of the things that happened is uh, things like starling mites and the many Australian native relatives of those, um, they're not all pest, introduced pests by any means, but um, the uh, they've also given rise to this enormous uh, radiation of, there's at least 500 species of things that live up bird noses. So um, the birds would prefer not to have those. And it's another reason why you shouldn't kiss your parrots. Um, but um, yeah, highly specialised things. It's uh, another, another um, part of the complexity of the environment. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. So I, I advertised it was going to be about, well, I, one of the things that was picked out in the ad was I was going to talk about decomposing soil and I didn't get into that so much, sorry. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, use human um, environments. Um, I mean, the classic is house dust mites and that happened ever since the, the beginning of... Uh, people having living indoors, um, and it didn't just happen in Western culture; it happened in um, you know uh, American cultures too. Um, and so there's at least you know roughly 20 species of major house dust mite, and they're they're all invaded separately. Um, uh, and they're things that can tolerate dryness and uh, like living on mould. Um, yeah, and those those and they actually originally came from nests. So um, so studying of nests actually has a lot of relevance to understanding uh, what can invade homes. So um, and some of the things that uh, have become house dust mites have incredibly specialised relatives, like amazingly specialised relatives. Um, 
uh, there's several examples like of that. Even the, one of the most common stored product mites of all um, has uh, uh, relatives which which can only uh, complete their life cycle by hopping onto rat fleas during their life cycle and things like that, and <laughs> others that that only live on um, marsupial tails and things like this. Um, so um, yeah, the, the, yeah. So people have been and and then there's all the mites that invite invade uh, foodstuffs. Um, so there's quite a few things and grains and spices and things like that. There's even one described from, you know, those fish they make fish paste out of. Um, there's a mite described from people preparing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, thank you very much, Matthew. I, I'd like to really take home that one phrase that you used of how complex is the natural world? And uh, so the most amazing, informative and entertaining talk. And thank you very much. <laughs> so that you know a little bit more about our butterflies, yeah. we have a copy of our oh, book for you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank nice. you.